it's good to be back Trevor I must say it is good to be back here at Beer Sweden HQ are you waving that about have you got it give it a whirl I don't know should I record this uh, yeah give it record it oi are we up Trevor you cheeky little monkey we're on aren't we look I can see the red light hello everyone and welcome to yet another outdoor episode of Beer Sweden television it is television that we do of course it is it is television um, today we are well as you can see we're outside again I didn't think we were going to be outside today, Trevor. When I looked at the um, thermometer, it was plus one. Not exactly t-shirt weather, unless, of course, you're wearing a t-shirt like this. Feast your eyes on this, Trev. Is this not the beer fashion statement of 2010? Rubbish. Huh? Absolutely beautiful. Give it a whirl, people. We are going to actually let you know how you can get hold of one of these t-shirts. I do promise, on the blog, if we haven't already done so. Um, now, what are we doing here today, Trev? What are we do? Trev, by the way, I've got to tell everyone that before we started filming today, Trev um, and I had a little bit of an argument, didn't we, Trev? I say argument, but a little bit of a fallout. Well, what does your wife say when you're unfaithful? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like, well, you see, the problem is that... I mean, he wasn't that good, was he? Look at this, look at this, look at this. Kinetic filming, look at this. Come this. back to Earth, come back to Earth. There you go. Oh. Tell you what, I feel a bit seasick after that, Trev. Um, the problem is, is that as if followers of the blog will know, I did a little bit of filming down at the Stockholm Beer Festival. We've just come back from that Stockholm Beer Festival. A couple of weeks down there, had a great time, brilliant show. And while I was there, I took the camcorder and I obviously committed a, the, 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 the heinous crime of, of giving the camera to a colleague of mine and he filmed me while I was going around the hall. Uh, and uh, Trev's not really taken too kindly to that, which is why he's actually sat me directly in front of the sun so that it's actually burning my pupils out as we speak. Does he know how, how hard I am? He, 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 I think he does know how hard you are. So, um, you know, that's why Trev's a little bit more grumpy than you normally are. Isn't that true, Trev? Fair enough. Anyway, um, let's move on because really what we're here to talk about is beer, isn't it? And the beer that we're going to be talking about today is... Uh, what's that all about? The beer that we're talking about today is this one. Have you got that, Trev? Can you see it? Beautiful beer. If you can throw up all the details about that. This is one of the uh, beers that came out into the system Belaga actually while we were away. Um, and, um, you know, it is, if you know beer and you like porter, uh, this is an absolute must try. Uh, it's from Fuller's. And Fuller's, of course, are a London brewery. Your neck of the woods, Trev, although the posher part, I think in the west part, and like Chiswick, west sort of side of London, rather, than, rather than your... Uh, you know, south southeasty sort of proper. Um, proper. Uh, but anyway, it's a London brewery uh, from Chiswick. I think they're 350 plus years old, uh, traditional, um, but um, at the same time uh, releasing a lot of contemporary sort of styles uh, as well. Uh, very interesting brewery, Fuller's. And their London Porter right now is rated, I think it's the second highest rated Porter in the world, Trev, on something called Rate Beer. Dot com. Actually, that's worth talking about just for a couple of seconds. Ratebeer.com is a wonderful online resource. If you are looking to actually learn a bit more about beer, if you want some tips on which beers to try, if you want to actually record some of your tasting notes, and I know that sounds geeky, people, I know it does, but I do recommend actually, as you, you know, if you want to get a little bit more serious about beer tasting uh, and you, you know, trying beers, it's a very, very good idea to try and write down. I'm not expecting you to do a beer Sweden. Uh, on, on every beer that you try but it's very good if you can or useful if you can write down what you think about the beers that you try you can actually do that on ratebeer.com set up your own account you can go in there you can just write a few little notes about how you felt what it smelled like what it looked like what it tasted like and it's quite interesting because you can actually go back you know a few months later and and see what you thought of and this gives you all sorts of stats on the types of beers that you like and the styles that you prefer it's a really interesting online resource and I recommend you dip in there and have a look at it www.ratebeer.com Trev you'll link us up for that yeah um, now on that uh, in that it's the largest online database of sort of tastings reviews from normal beer drinkers as well as geeks and you know uh, people like me um, uh, journalists uh, writers bloggers etc 
etc. Is it English? Uh, it's English, yeah. Well, it's English based, yeah. But, um, but it's I think it's American space, run, but there's a lot of European influence on it. There's a lot of French writing. There's a lot of German. There's a lot of everything's in there. It's huge. It's it's huge. It's packed full of information. It really is an interesting place to go to. Anyway, this collective group of people have rated this actually right now as the second highest rated porter in the world. Fantastic. Really interesting. Now, of course, you'll see that it actually has come to us uh, in a can. What do you think about that, Trev? In a can. That's interesting for me because it gives us the opportunity to actually talk a little bit about cans and beer. Did that look good, Trev? Did that look premium to you? A lot of people... Well, the connotations, obviously, I mean, the, 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 the perception is obviously a bit naff, isn't it? Yeah. There's a lot of social, I think, prejudice, actually, when it comes to cans. People ask me, uh, and ask me many, many times, um, is there a difference between beer that comes out of a bottle and beer that comes out of a can. And I think really what they're trying to say is, is there a metallic taste? Often people think there's a metallic taste associated with beers. The answer in my experience, in my experience, is there is absolutely no difference between the taste of beer that comes out of a can uh, and that that comes out of, out of a bottle in optimal conditions. The problem is, also the problem is, but the reality is, is that when beer is put into a bottle, obviously it is in some way exposed to light. Clear glass obviously being a very clear filter and, 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 and in that respect the light interacts with the beer more quickly and more violently than if it's in brown glass which is the best glass protector towards light. Uh, but it does change the beer in some way. If you put it into a can of course you have a complete blackout. This is an oxygen free zone and it is a light free zone. So the beer itself, one could argue Trev, is actually best preserved in a can, okay. Thing now, is, sorry. Yeah, go on. Thing is, though, that thing you said about tasting like beer. I mean, that that's just an that's just almost a, a, an old wives' tale in the sense of that was when tin cans were still tin cans. Tin cans, of course, I don't moved think into aluminium, aluminium cans. Exactly. Yeah, I don't yeah. think aluminium, aluminium gives off a taste, does it? It used to. Well, there are metal ions, I think, that used to be, leach into the beer. Okay. There were bad cans. Sorry, back in aluminum. The day, back in the or aluminum. That's right for our American viewers. Uh, there were bad cans back in the day, but modern canning technology, whereby the cans themselves are actually spray lined, they're actually lined internally. There is absolutely no uh, transference of any metal flavours whatsoever. You know where it really is, Tred? It's all up here. Mm. It's all up here. It's all about perception. And there are some people that will, you know, that will obviously swear blind to the grave that beer in a can tastes different from beer in a bottle. That's fair enough. If that's the way you feel about it, drink it out of a bottle. Um, personally, um, I always like to drink my beer out of a glass, whether that's transferred via a bottle or via a can. It's absolutely important to put it into a glass first. Um, but, you know, there we go. I mean, it's one of those debates, can versus bottle, you can go on about for a long time. Personally, I think uh, yeah, a can, um, you can get a superb beer out of a can these days. Before I started working with you, yep. with this, uh, be a Sweden TV because it is TV. It is. It is TV. Isn't it, it is it? TV. It is. I always drank. If I bought what I had at home, I always drank them out of the bottles. I didn't know any better. I didn't know about all this whirling stuff. No. And I must say, it's improved my well, it's, tasting experience enormously. Exactly. A lot of people, you know, it's, it's actually if, if you drink beer straight out of a can, you're missing the point anyway. Or out of a bottle. The fact is, if it comes to you in a can or a bottle, put it into a glass because obviously the very action of putting it into a glass is, is, is mixing a bit of oxygen in there. It's, it's releasing the aromatics. It's making the beer as good as it can be. Drinking it straight out of a can is a no-no. Drinking it straight out of the bottle is as well. Um, so, you know, there are people that are always going to swear by cans and other people that can prefer bottles. Great. We are very qualitarian here in the beer world. We don't care. We always drink beer. Um, now, the at the colour. Look, look at the colour. And it's a stunning colour, Trevor. I don't know if you can see it in this light, so direct light like this, but it is incredibly dark. It looks almost black, but it's not. Again, it's one of those beers that's deep, deep sort of claret, burgundy, ruby colour with a very nice, slightly frothy, foamy, beige tinted head to it. Lovely looking beer, exactly as, a, as I would hope a porter would look like. Do you know about porter, Trev? Do you know about the style? It's, it's, it's one of those stories that I love in the beer world, uh, di often disputed, a bit like IPAs. People don't really know the origins of porters, but this is the story that I know and I'm sticking to. 1722, Trev, London. 1722, what were you doing then? 
Were you around in those days? I was running from, no, it wasn't the Great Fire, that was a few years after. That was a few years after. Mm. 1722, London. Basically, uh, in those days, uh, it was quite uh, popular for porters, and these are big, hefty guys, a bit like yourself, Trev, that used to actually work in London, carrying stuff from A to B. You know, this is before DHL. This is way before the days of DHL. Okay, uh, and they used to carry stuff about. That was what they. That was their. That was their job. And they used to go into pubs and drink, obviously, lots of beer. Sometimes between 11 to 14 pints a day. Who would do that, Trev? Nice job. Uh, anyway, they used to prefer, rather than drinking a straight beer, they used to prefer a blend of three different types of beer. It was a brown ale, uh, and it was a brown ale that was a mature brown ale, so it's slightly stale. A fresh brown ale and a matured pale ale. And they'd ask the landlord to mix these three beers into one drink. Okay. Now the half and half, but right? not that. Yeah, but this was a three beers. It's, it's complicated. You can imagine the landlords of the pubs get a little bit fed up with this because they had to spend a lot of time actually trying to get three different beers out of three different casks, mix them together. So one guy actually called Ralph Harwood. Okay, he came up with a beer called Entire. That was the name of it. In which he tried to replicate these three flavors into one drink. Are you with me so far? When and, was this? And this was from 1722. This was the first registered or recorded uh, date when this beer was actually uh, was actually uh, yeah, it was it was recorded. Um, and that's really where porter came out of. Um, the porters got used to drinking it, and entire over the years was was sort of transformed into the porter style of beer. I'm absolutely exhausted, Trev. Should we drink some of it now? That's the history lesson over and done with. It was um, interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, so there we go. Interesting lesson. Now, listen, it may be a porter, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't give it a whirl. Now, with this, <laughs> quite unusual actually, that wasn't what I was expecting. Excuse me, one minute, just. With this beer, with this type of colour, with this coloured head, what are we expecting? Obviously we're looking for the malts. There's a lot of malts in here. Well, I say there's a lot. There's three. There's crystal malt, there's brown malt, and there's chocolate malt. There's three different types of malts. The hops used in this beer are Fuggles, classic, earthy, British hop. So you're getting a lot of malt character with hopefully a little bit of balance from that uh, Fuggles, okay? So, and this is exactly what I'm smelling on the nose. You're getting chocolate, you're getting so that nice roasted sort of quality to the beer. Uh, you're getting a little bit of licorice, I think. It's a little bit of licorice, and there's quite a little bit of wine drops in there as well, Trev. Like a little bit of wine drops. A little bit sort of whiny as well. This is the thing that's throwing me. Quite creamy too, nutty, uh, walnuts. It is actually delicious. It's, it's, a, it's a really sort of, you know, for this sort of weather, you know, as the winter months are approaching, absolutely gorgeous. It's quite sweet as well. 5.4% people. This has actually been so, oh this is lovely, it's absolutely, it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's wholesome, it's everything I want a porter to be. It's got that lovely balance of, it's not too sweet, it's got quite a lot of sweetness up front, but these malts are quite burnt almost, you know, they're almost roasted, a little bit of espresso coffee in there as well, and they actually just match up with that sweetness beautifully, so that one doesn't actually outpower the other one. Bitterness wise, yeah, there's a little tingle at the end there too, but not too much. It's an absolutely sumptuous drink, love it. Can I smell, can I taste any can? No, I cannot. In terms of rating, Trev, now, we must rate this, because I've been a bit slack, haven't I, recently? We must rate this. Yeah, In terms of rating. Stop, 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 stop. Yeah, I know, I saw that. Thanks very much on the last episode. Uh, in terms of rating, I'm going four point four point two. Really? Four point two, Trev. Yeah. 4.2. Yeah, I do like it. I think it's a great example of a British porter. It's got drinkability. It hasn't got those extreme, extreme flavours of your uh, US porters and Imperial porters and stouts. Uh, this is still 5.4. It's balanced, people. It's balanced and it's incredibly drinkable. Recommend it. Okay, well, that was that. That was interesting. We did cans, we did t shirts, we did porter. Um, I think we've run out of time, Trev. So all I can say now is. Cheers and beers.